this is a picture I took of some guard dogs on a ranch I used to work at, and it has served no purpose except for that it's the end of the day. So um, I figured nobody wanted to listen to a guy talk about software after a long day of presentations. So hopefully these puppies will help. <laughs> Um, but yeah, today basically a uh, quick presentation. I'm just going to run us through uh, kind of this idea broadly of, of software, um, how it integrates to your guys' operation. Um, a lot of folks are working in the NRCS, or uh, we have ranch planners here, we have ranchers, we have a diverse set of people. Software is this, uh, this thing that can sometimes just make our lives a lot worse. Um, and so I'm going to talk about ways that we can think about what software is at its core and um, maybe how it doesn't have to suck. Um, but there's, it's been a long day, you've listened to a lot of people talk, so I kind of want to start with an exercise. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I just want to start with this concept of, um, and this is actually based on how I ended up in the software world. Um, I was working on a lot of ranches um, all over. None of them were making any money. Uh, so I went back to grad school for agricultural economics and then was finishing up and uh, was moving out to Oregon to manage a lease there. And we didn't, uh, with a partner and I, and we had no idea how many animals we should run or anything about it. And so I was like, I think I can solve this problem uh, with computers. And so I built a software application um, to do with that and to calculate stocking rates uh, using web soil survey data or rangeland uh, analysis platform data. and then worked with CSU Extension, and now I guess I work in tech. So, um, and it was a similar problem though, so I wanted to like walk us through um, this problem and, and talk kind of as a group how we might solve this um, if this were you guys. And so, uh, we have a, a lease that's, that's come up. Uh, you're a rancher, uh, put your rancher hat on if you're not a rancher, and um, you have this, this problem set to solve where they're, they're willing to give you a lease for $9 an acre per year, um, and it's 3,500 acres, which is um, uh, you know, a lot of land uh, to, to expand your operation, and you're trying to decide whether you should take that deal. And so I'm curious, like, don't think about software, ignore the fact that this is about software, how would we handle this situation? Anybody feel free to bring up an idea. How would you, you have this problem set identified, a new lease, if you're trying to figure out if you should take it based on that, where do you go? What do you do? You have to talk. <laughs> What's that? Cost per AUM. Cost per AUM. How would you go about doing that? Dollar per acre times the acre. Divide that by how many AUM views you've got. You can use the 300 years each year for six months as kind of a baseline. How would you figure out how many AUMs? That the place has? Uh, yearly shares. Do you go walk around on the pasture? Yeah. Point, point seven ish. Right, so, so outside of the calculation, but you're, you're thinking, okay, how many animals? Because this is a dollar per acre lease, right? It's not a dollar per AUM lease, which, is, right. which then incentivizes you. You really want to maximize how many AUMs you can have there, um, which is, you know, he gave you the. the Absentee owner was like, "Oh yeah, I think they ran 300," uh, but you don't know if that's that's good or bad or how that fits, you know, how that demand matches supply. And so, um, yeah, how how might we go about figuring out our supply options? Yeah, I mean, obviously, range inventory, knowing what grasses you have out there, knowing what the moisture was that year, what the regular year, timing when they turned out, timing when they wanted to leave. You basically have to do a snapshot of everything the predecessor did before, and then walk through all your pieces and then decide with that person they're going to be open to that. Sure. What if last year they ran 300 steers, it seemed to work, but it was like a really wet year. And you took your range inventory and it was a really wet year. And now you, you, figured, you figured, oh man, I bet I can run 400 yearlings on that. But now it's dry year. You didn't know what, the, what dry year forage conditions looked like on that place. Okay, none of this actually matters because this ranch doesn't exist and you don't have this lease. <laughs> but I, I ask these things to get us thinking, right? These are hard questions um, to solve, especially if we don't have historical context for a property. And so a couple of key answers that I'll give you off the bat, don't use software, talk to neighbors. 
if you have a new lease, go talk to neighbors, see what, what is possible there um, and what the historical context of the property is. But also, there, there's a, a role for software in this, in this paradigm and there's a role for data. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so this is just a general slide to talk about how much data is out there. Um, in ag, there is, there's data from all sorts of different sources, right? We have like tractor data if we're haying, we have public source data, um, there's IoT, there's agronomists, there's NRCS data, there's technical service providers. It's just, it abounds. But making use of this data is really, really hard. And that's kind of the role of good software, is to make use of really complex, disparate data. Um, and that's hopefully um, any product that you're working with, or you're is coming to your farm or ranch, or, or you're thinking about developing or whatever, um, is really trying to create value from data in a meaningful way. And, and I'll tell you right now, it's not another dashboard. Um, most likely, you can go to the next slide. Um, okay, so in this activity, um, quick aside, this is just a kind of a fun photo that has nothing to do with software. Uh, when one time I worked on this sheep ranch in Idaho, and the second day I showed up, uh, we had wildfire. We talked a lot about wildfire. Uh, so we moved like 4,000 sheep out of the hills of Idaho, uh, and this was that day. That's kind of fun. Um, nothing to do with what we're doing. But I, you all have notebooks um, out, and so I'd like uh, for you guys to think about your, your business and think about the data associated to your business. And if you're a rancher, that's great. Let's think about rancher data, but there's a lot of people in the audience that aren't ranchers, so this can apply to anybody. Um, but all, all of us are collecting data all the time for anything that we do. And the way that we collect that data is very important to whether that's gonna be a useful use of our time in collecting that data, or it's just gonna end up in another notebook on the shelf that we never use, or it's gonna end up um, in an Excel table that we never use, or another form that we never use. So um, I want us to just like take a minute and write down all of the data that you collect in your business. Um, so that can be, you're out there and you have your notebook and you take animal records. Maybe you tag animals every year um, and you tag every calf as it comes down. Or um, this could be, you know, you tr keep all your expenses tracked in QuickBooks or whatever it is. Um, just think through all the data that you collect about your business. And then I'm gonna have you tell everybody, so. All right, who has a couple uh, that they want to share? Anybody? Data you collect about the business you're in? Pregnancy rate. Pregnancy rate. Awesome. Pregnancy what do you, uh, and then number two, what do you use to collect that data? How do you collect it? By a notebook? Oh. No, that, and then we put it in our scale head. Got it. Yep, cool. What else? Grazing records. Grazing records. What do you use to keep track of that? The date book. The uh, date book? Yeah. Yep. In and out dates and pasture names and things like that. Perfect. What other data do we collect? Revenue and expenses. Revenue and expenses. How do you collect that data? Uh, yep. Yep. Cool. What else? Okay, well you guys get the idea. Um, there's a lot of data that we're collecting. And when we collect that data, uh, a, a note I wanna share with everybody is think about how you can u like collect that data in a format that's gonna be usable. And in the world we're in right now, it's probably gonna be digital. And so <coughs> take your time as the, as the year slows down, and maybe you do have all those notebooks um, where you wrote down a bunch of notes from the summer about your pasture conditions, about animals, tag numbers, 
you know, you have your little pocketbook. The more that you can transition to collect that data in some sort of digital format means that as carbon markets develop and ranch plans are needed and there's evidence needed for the things that you're doing, having that data in a structured format is going to make it infinitely easier for the folks who are selling those carbon credits and they're going to be able to go to work for you guys to, to, to sell things better and, and make more money in, in whatever it is. And so the, the more that we can start at the ranch level to collect good data and then structure that data um, through Excel tables or maybe there's a software tool that you use, um, the better. And so um, that's, that's kind of what I want to leave you uh, with in this slide. And there's a lot of data and uh, sometimes it's like pushing sheep in a wildfire. <laughs> I think I brought that back around. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's another slide, I think. Uh, yeah, the, this one. You want to go, you just want to open that map? Can I do that? Um, so I want to leave you just like with something really tangible that you can all do uh, in software. And I know I didn't like sell anything to you guys today or anything. That's okay. Um, so this is something that I think every ranch can do uh, really easily. And if you haven't done it, you should do it because um, it'll help everybody in your life. Um, including your kids or your interns or just anybody. And that's create a good ranch map. And there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, but one that I've used on a lot of ranches um, is just Google My Maps. It's free. You can export the data into a format that every software tool can use. Um, you don't have to pay for an Esri license or, you know, and it's super simple to use. And so, um, what we can do here is you, if you want to go in uh, and, oh, because this is showing the public view, but you can like unclick that web cell survey information, which is stuff I added in there, and then um, go and click on the infrastructure planning. Top one. Yeah, so this is a, a guy that I worked with in New Mexico that actually Kateri is working with, which is cool and funny small world. Um, and we worked together to basically go into Google My Maps and uh, if you guys need help with this, my contact's information, I'm happy to help you set it up. But we just started to draw out the infrastructure that's in place at the ranch. Um, where were there pipelines that were put in underground? Really useful to know. If you die, do the people who are going to take over your ranch. Do they know where the water infrastructure is? Maybe not. Map it. Um, and so just mapping out where all the fence lines were, where the water infrastructure are, where the tanks are, where the pastures are. And once we have that in place, it's awesome to do in a publicly like or a free format like this, right? You're not tied into some software that, you know, you can't export the data or whatever. That's why I think Google My Maps is awesome. Um, then we can start to use that data for calculating forage estimates. So then what I do is I take this data and I, the cool little calculator I made back when I got into software, I put that in there, those, these pastures, and then you can click on this soil information. Or actually, no, yeah, we're, we got it up. So click on one of those pastures for me. So then I put that into a little calculator that I made that uses web soil survey data. Um, and now I can see what the low forage, average forage, and high forage is uh, in a pounds per acre per year estimate for that pasture based on web soil survey data. All data is wrong. So, um, you know, or well, not all data is wrong, but all, all models are wrong, some are useful. And a lot of that data is modeled, so be careful. You know, it's not uh, going to be 1,600 pounds necessarily next year if it's a rainy year, but it starts to give me that context, right, where as we think about a new lease or whatever, if I can go and I can draw the pastures in that lease and I say, oh, okay, if it's going to be a good wet year, I might get 1,600 pounds of forage uh, and that, that'll equate to, you know, 13,000 animal days or something like that. So I can start to do that math um, because I've, I've got good maps in place. So I think that's a really tangible place for any ranch or farm uh, to start is get a good infrastructure map in place and then we can deploy that to all sorts of cool software uh, and cool tools. So. Yeah, that's kind of all I got. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or talk about this more. I could talk about ranch software for a long time, probably. 
Um, but I thought this would be a useful presentation at the end of the day. So yeah, I'll hand it over to a guy with cool collars to talk about making maps and stuff. Thank you, Reed. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for letting me take us over the finish line at the end of the day here. My name is John, and I work with Vents. We're a virtual fencing company. Essentially, what we do is put collars on cows and use sound and shock stimulus to influence where those animals spend their time on the landscape. And our ultimate goal is to provide a tool to producers and land managers that can reduce the costs associated with labor and infrastructure, while at the same time enabling the grazing principles and practices that can improve range and ecology and minimize the impact of wildlife. There are three main components of that system. The first is gonna be the collar that goes on animal. The second is a base station, which we use to create a network across the ranch that the callers communicate through. And the third is the herd manager software, and that's what the producer will log into on their desktop computer, build their virtual fence lines, and analyze any of the data that the callers are collecting. So this is the caller. Do you mind pulling that up for me? You can put it on, load it up, whatever you want. So this is version 2.5, weighs about two and a half pounds with a battery inside it. It's got two chains coming off the plastic body. One is positive, one is negative. There's two plastic links at the top. That's actually the break in the circuit. And the chains are where the electric stimulus is delivered. The chains double back. They're attached with a metal zip tie right now, though we may go with a locking carabiner in the future. And then if you wanna spin that guy around, there's two D-rings on the back. Those will both split out at about 650 pounds of pull force in case an animal gets hung up on a tree or on a T-post. Think of a newer version of the collar. This plastic link is actually gonna be that break point. In that situation, you wouldn't have to get a brand new collar. You just throw on an extra plastic top link and you're good to go if you can put that collar back on the animal. Mm -hmm. Inside, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. There's a circuit board, but the most important pieces are gonna be a radio chip. And that radio chip communicates back and forth with the base station, which we'll go into in a moment here. And that's how we get data in and data out. The data coming off the collar is primarily gonna be location data, where that animal's at. And then data going to the collar is primarily gonna be instructions for a new virtual fence lines. There's also a GPS chip inside, and that GPS chip is listening to the satellites. We're not talking back and forth with the satellites, we're simply listening so that the collar can fix its location and know where it's at. And behind the two plastic screws, there's a face plate that comes off, there's a battery inside, it looks a lot like a D-cell battery except it's purple. It's made by a company called Tadiran out of Israel. It's just a really energy dense lithium type battery. We looked at the solar panels, we looked at the rechargeables. Solar panels are expensive, they get dirty, they break, and we think there's limited efficacy in how much they actually charge. And then when you have a rechargeable battery, one, it's bigger, two, it's more expensive, and then most importantly, it can't really handle the hot and the cold. Just like if you leave your cell phone on the dash of your car during a really hot day, you can drain the battery quickly. So ours is just an energy dense lithium type battery designed to prevent that. And the battery life for a standard producer in Montana, kind of American West, is gonna be six to nine months is typically what we're seeing. The tighter you manage, the harder that GPS works. And it's not so much the sound and the shock on the call that's draining the battery, it's really the GPS working hard. So the tighter you go, the less battery life you have. And then if you're on bigger pastures, say thousands of acres, like some of the folks in Northwest Colorado, you can have a year plus on that battery. So some variation, but it just depends on what you're asking for. So how virtual fencing actually works is it's less like a hard line in the sand where you're very clearly in and very clearly out, and it's more of a, a pressure zone. And there's water pressure, heat pressure, herd pressure, topography pressure. And we think of vents as another artificial form of pressure that we can layer on top and control the timing and location of that pressure. And the more that you understand that and use it with how your animals and what your animals want to do naturally, the better success rate you're gonna have. But a virtual fence line on the software looks like this red and white line. You can ignore the two blues there, that's just different ways to visualize the paddock. But the white is the sound zone, which is 15 yards wide as a standard setting, and the red is the sound plus shock zone, which is 75 yards wide as a standard setting. And what that looks like is an animal moves into the sound zone, they get a beep, cues them to turn around to return to the herd, and if they continue on into the sound plus shock zone, they get a beat plus a shock. And we have timeouts for animal health safety in case they get hung up or confused in that shock zone. 
so the call will actually time out. This is also set up as a one-way gate with passive recapture, we call it. So the animal is going to have pressure going out. So let's say we're trying to keep them in here. They're going to get pressure through the zone. But if they make it through once they go to side, maybe a calf pulls them out, there's a storm or something like that, there's actually no pressure on this side. So no sound, no shock. But if they want to come back into the paddock, maybe return to water, return to the herd, they're actually not going to get any sound or shock on the way back in. But as soon as they're back inside, that virtual fence line is going to turn back on. So one-way gate, passive recapture is the way that it's designed. It's a good standard design for a virtual fence, but it also allows us to do a whole bunch of interesting stuff when it comes to rotational grazing. For example, we could flip this virtual fence line over, let the animals naturally drift over, and be passively captured in the next paddock. Wheel grazes, ladder grazes, all that good stuff. We also have exclusion zones, basically the opposite. Let's say there's a riparian area, you want to keep the animals out of a burn zone. You can put a virtual fence line along that, they move into that area, they're going to get pressure to turn around and come out. Next up is the base station. This is a really important fundamental component of the system. It's a pretty small footprint, about three foot by four foot. We put some rebar stakes in the ground that are 36 inches long, three quarter inch, pretty minimal footprint. We raise the mass to about 20 feet and we're kind of on this territory unless we're maybe perched on top of a mountain. We don't necessarily have to raise the mass, but we'd like to. And then we have anchor points that go to guy wires. There's three of those and they're each 10 foot off the mast. We'll put some panels around this or some mesh wire if there's going to be a lot of elk in the area so they don't run up on the guy wires. Within the base station, three main components. The first is going to be the power system. Four batteries inside, the 12 volt car type batteries, but the marine grade. Solar panel, that charges the batteries. Batteries power all the electronics. And then at the top here, the skinny white antenna is what's called a LoRa antenna. And that's what creates the network across the ranch that the callers communicate through. So we create our own network. And if anybody's into radio stuff, the protocol that we use is LoRaWAN, long range, wide area network. It's low power, low data. It's what allows us to put a caller on an animal and have it do its thing for six to nine months and have the battery last and we're sending very small snippets of text, basically, so kilobytes, very small amounts of data back and forth across the network we're creating. This trapezoid-looking white antenna here is our cellular backhaul, so that's how we bridge what's going on with the callers and then your ability to access that information through the internet. We use either Verizon or AT&T right now, and Fiero, some other small guys, and we backhaul all that information out to a cell network. Important to note that we don't need cell coverage across the entire ranch. Callers don't need it by any means, they're autonomous. But we do want a cell signal specifically where we put this base station. That's the only place we need it. And we typically put them up high, and the radio signals are typically up high. The cell guys use the same things we do. So knock on the road, we've been pretty good about getting cell signal even in some tough areas. But it's certainly something that we plan around. And the golden question is how many acres does the base station cover? And it entirely depends. So what we do is what's called an RF plan. You'll send a map of the property. You know, for example, this is a Forest Service permit outside of Carbondale near Aspen in Colorado. It's about 35,000 acres. I'll take that map, put it in Google Earth, exaggerate the elevation times three so all the mountains look big and I can really tell what the topography is doing. And then we take individual points. So these little guys right here, the orange dots, are potential base station locations. And we may look at 20 base station locations and only end up going with four of them. So we do a pretty robust planning process for each project. And we'll take those GPS locations, plug them into a tool called CloudRF, spits out these images based on the DBMs and all the radio stuff, essentially our projected coverage. And what we see are these maps. So the green and the blue. The green is what we want to see. We want to cover as much of the ranch as possible. Blue is where things start to trail off a little bit. It's called functional coverage. Still good, but you want some overlapping coverage there. And our goal, again, is to cover as much of the ranch as possible and also have overlapping coverage. The engineers will tell us that a caller should be able to communicate with two and a half, or excuse me, yeah, a caller should be able to communicate with two and a half base stations at any given time. We don't always hit that in the field, but it's something to strive for. So the better coverage we can get, the more updates you're going to get from the caller in terms of location data points, and then the faster you're going to be able to send updates to those callers for new instructions and virtual fence lines. You'll notice there's still some dead zones here. Those are low valleys, areas where we don't expect to be able to communicate with the callers. But knowing the American West is really rough and rugged, we designed the product knowing we're probably never going to have complete 100% coverage across a ranch. 
So you can still run a virtual fence line through these dead zones. You know, for example, north to south, through the green, through the dead zones. As long as you download that information into the caller's memory, the caller says, thumbs up, I've got those instructions, I'm good to go. It can go down into those dead zones. It has it in its memory, and it's listening to the satellite to fix the caller's location. So you'll still get your sound, you'll still get your shot, just like you're supposed to. Only thing you're not gonna get is the location data coming off the caller, and then the ability to make a change to the virtual fence line. So our adaptability goes down in the system, the less base station coverage we have, and our adaptability and our data richness goes up, the higher quality coverage we have. And we plan around all that based on what the management goals are at the ranch. Next up is the herd manager software. This is what you'll log into on your desktop computer, build your virtual fence lines. You can associate ear tags with caller IDs. You can manage them to the individual animal. The next line has a better view here. Yeah. So all these colors are just different ways to visualize paddocks. You can put in gates, water sources, all types of stuff. And that's just so you can see what's going on in the software. And then you have your little cow icons here, and those are your location data points. And you can change those to different color schemes to mean different things. For example, does this caller have the most recent update that I sent it? Or is this location data point 30 minutes old? Or is it 12 hours old? Different ways to visualize the data in the software. And what I think is really cool are the heat maps over here on the right hand side. You can look at the location history of a single animal or the entire herd, and you can play it back point by point, or you can play it back in a heat map that moves across the screen, kind of like a radar map. So you can see where the animals are putting pressure on the landscape and potentially where they're not. There's a whole bunch of ways to utilize that data. This is where we're at in the American West. Vents was founded in 2016, a little backstory. Pilot programs by four years. Last year at the very beginning was our first year of commercialization. We went from maybe a thousand callers in the field to 25 or 30,000. I think probably 150 to 160 individual producers that we work with right now. And you'll notice we're generally in the American West. We're a tool for <coughs> big western rangeland. We don't do really any of that stuff up in the Northeast. I would say about 100 acres is the tightest that we would want to manage first year in particular for a few different reasons, but that's about as tight as we want to get, and that's what our customer success team will say. So again, our fit is that big western rangeland, the American West, and not necessarily the stuff up in the Northeast. But we do have one cool project in South Carolina where it's a few thousand acres, and they use fire and grazing to improve the habitat for bird hunting, which is cool, I never do that, but that's an interesting project we have on the East Coast. And we're probably 40 to 50,000 callers in the field, Pricing is pretty simple model right now. We have the base stations. Those are a fixed infrastructure cost. So you purchase those and you own those. Self installs, which the majority of private producers will do, are $10,000. If you want us to come out and help you get it installed, you still help us build it, get it to the site, but we run our tools, make sure everything goes smoothly, confirm functionality. That's $12,500. And I'll say that most BLM Forest Service or NGO projects will have us come out to install those, at least for the first couple. The callers themselves are in a subscription model, so that's $40 per year per caller. You can use it for six months, you can use it for 12 months, doesn't really matter to us. Of course, 12 months would be great, but that $40 includes the software, the customer support, and a working caller. So if you have a caller that falls off, you can't find it, or has a mechanical failure, maybe an electrical failure, we'll replace that caller. There's no fee associated with that, which is nice, especially as this technology is evolving, because it evolves pretty quickly. The batteries are just 10 bucks a pop. You purchase those as needed. I'd say most producers in Montana and Colorado are gonna be one battery for a year if they're grazing seasonally. And then the folks that are winter grazing might be looking at two batteries, call it 60 bucks per year. Sorry, I think I hit some of the laser. <laughs> All right, so, but there's all sorts of other ROIs that we've discovered over the past couple of years that have been really exciting. I think an obvious one is fencing costs, particularly in mountainous areas. $15,000 a mile, $20,000 a mile, pretty common with what we hear. Especially when you're talking about cross-fencing, this allows you to be able to fence quite a bit of ground that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. 
but I really think the adaptability of the system is where the real value comes in, and being able to manage a big chunk of ground in a way that you want to, but maybe in the past was prohibited by labor and infrastructure, or even just time. And then if you actually built those cross fences and next year you realize you really wish you shifted a quarter mile, that would have been better over there, you've got to be really motivated to pull out that fence and change that. But with fence, you're able to make those adjustments and able to make those changes. So a really adaptable system. We can also reduce labor times in terms of gathering and maybe shift those three weeks that you ride to gather down to one week. So that can be really useful for folks as well as inventory management in case you left the cow behind and you go back and get it. There's also some ROIs that are a little bit harder to put a quantitative number on, and those typically involve agencies and wildlife. I think a good example of that is Northwest Colorado with the Camblins. Really cool family up there, Dana Camblin. She had a piece of ground called the Fritter Brush, or her family did, and they ended up having to sell it to Colorado Parks and Wildlife in the 90s. And just two years ago, she got that permit back to graze, which she's really excited about. And Dana is pretty progressive. She moves her animals often, uses poly wire, soil health minded. But Colorado Parks and Wildlife has a lot of sage grouse and a lot of pronghorn on the bitter brush. So they don't want any new infrastructure out there. So what they did is purchase two base stations through CPW. Dana purchased the collars to plug into the network. Now she's able to manage the way that she wants to. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife has really good grazing pressure and they get the benefit of having no Nothing that's going to impact wildlife with the safe grass or the problem on a piece of ground. So, a good example right there, and again, like a little bit harder to put a quantitative number on that, but we really believe that there's value there. We're going to continue to work on the collar over the next couple of years. Uh, the big news for us was we were a startup, and then in the fall of last year, we were going to raise a Series B, and Merck Animal Health Ventures was going to lead that, and they saw an opportunity to purchase us outright, so they did. So we're in an incubation phase with Merck for the next couple of years, which is really exciting for us. We have a whole bunch more money in R&D. We have a ton of support from the people side and business operations from Merck, and I've been really excited and happy with working with the folks. So it's a really good thing for the product, and I think we're under a little less pressure to go out and sell as many units over the next couple of years, which is good for us. We'll probably sell 25,000 more next year, bring on maybe like 50 or 100 new customers, which is a better pace and a lot more manageable and will allow us to ultimately continue to work on the product. We're also gonna have some changes to the collar that are a little bit more near term. Uh, one of those is an RFID tag that's going in the collar. Uh, right now, there's a small white sort of sticker on here and that has the ID of the collar and it actually gets worn off really quickly. You can actually write it on with some Sharpie if you want to, but still these collars come back really beat up sometimes and don't know what the ID is. So there's an RFID chip in the new version of the collar with a different type of plastic. You'll be able to beat that collar with a wand and see which ID it is, which is one of the benefits. And the other benefit is that if you have the RFID here tagged from Merck, you run the animal through the chute, you used to have to write it down manually and plug it into the software. But in future versions, you'll be able to beep the collar, beep the ear tag, associate the two automatically. So we're continuing to make improvements and adjustments like that, and we're super excited. This is my contact info on the last slide here. So if anyone has any, if I can get it, <laughs> if anyone has any questions, uh, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Yeah, um, so I think kind of, I didn't get into what we're, what, what I'm up to in, in terms of my day job, but um, I'm working on building uh, software to, to help integrate a lot of these different data pieces and, and then track that um, across the supply chain for, for beef and bison production. And so um, as we think about uh, you know, Kateri's working really hard on a lot of the offset market that's based on the land asset. Um, there's also a lot of data that's, that's out there that's really cool with the animals on the land and tying that, that uh, data about the animals back to the land that they were raised on and then tracking those animals through the supply chain. And, and I think once we're able to do that, uh, think about being a producer and how often you sell your animals to whomever um, and you say you're a cow-calf operator, you sell your five-weight steers in the fall, and, and you never really know how those animals um, do in the feedlots, or you don't know any information about those animals. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited about thinking about ways that we can 
just get data from farther down the supply chain uh, back to producers. And then in terms of the sustainability side of things, uh, then we're also able to, to keep track of animals uh, and the practices and the, the management improvements on the land that were done with those animals, uh, which of course helps with, with marketing and additional uh, kind of value adds across the supply chain for those animals. And uh, John, I guess, what systems is fence or virtual fencing probably, you know, better or worse in tune to? Can you just like rip a little bit more? Yeah, on absolutely. That people use? So part of my job is really not so much selling the product, but being like a gatekeeper as to like who's a good product fit. Not so much that we don't want them using it, but that if they bought the product, they may end up disappointed. So we're really not a good tool to replace poly wire down low and really high productivity irrigated ground. We're not gonna be stepping cows 10 feet at a time. What we're good at is a subdivision tool for big acreage where you have limited amount of labor and infrastructure that you can put into you know, these big Western landscapes. So 3,000 acres, something like that, is generally the, the smallest ranch that we work with. Uh, we have a whole bunch of folks that were really interested in vents kind of at the very beginning of last year, commercialization, and we were just coming onto the market. And some of them were uh, like in Georgia area and Missouri, and they were knocking on the door really hard. And, and we sold a system to them, and I really don't think we should have. It was a few hundred acres, and they were just disappointed in the, in the product because there's a limited, we're limited in how tight we can actually manage. So I'd say Montana is probably a really good spot for us, bigger acreage, you know, animals are on bigger ranches out here. So I would say that that's it's probably the best fit for us at this point. And we're continuing to experiment with that tighter stuff, but we just don't know enough. And we'd much rather under promise and over deliver than the opposite. Yeah. Anyone else have any? Oh. Yeah. What, what kind of implications for wildlife management have, have you been able to realize um, with the system? Yeah, that's a great question. So some of this stuff is still early, so we don't have any studies that have come out or anything like that, but I think that anytime you're able to reduce the amount of fence, especially when we're talking about public ground, ground like Forest Service and BLM it has positives. One example that we're using in Colorado on some BLM ground is their sage grouse lex there, and the BLM wants to keep animals out of those lex at certain times of the year. So what we did was put collars on animals, the BLM actually purchased the base stations and allowed the producers to plug into the network, and then they worked together, producer and range technician, to come up with the exclusion zones. And that was a project that started this spring and has gone really, really well. The producers actually wanted to take those collars and use them up on their forest service permit that they go out into later in the year. Unfortunately, we didn't have the base stations to do that, but we may expand that project later. But I think that's a good example of what we've been working on this year. And I'd love to have some like, actual hard data and something that I can hand to someone on the paper that's a case study eventually, but they're more anecdotal at this point. Yes? Well, are the base stations movable? Like, if you were grading on one ranch or one permit for six months and then another place, could you move the... Good question. So uh, typically what happens is, we do an RF plan and we tell the producer, all right, you're gonna need five base stations and they'll get the job done. And they'll go, great, I'll buy two. And then they're gonna move them around and follow. And earlier last year, I, we tried that a few different times and we found some, some negatives, basically. So first one is base station's not designed to be moved. It's pretty fragile. So if it breaks, you're gonna be stuck with whatever's in those collars instructions wise. And that can become a crisis pretty quickly in certain situations. Number two is that we actually really want overlapping coverage. Like I mentioned earlier with those two and a half base stations per caller, that really improves the product experience, more data, faster update times for the callers. And if we don't have that, it can really hurt the user experience. Um, third, <coughs> we monitor the base stations remotely, so we can tell you if there's a change to the cell signal strength or quality or a change to the power system. And if we're moving the base stations around, that really limits our ability to do so. And then the final point is that people get really busy and we may have this grand plan of moving base stations and then we end up just not moving them or maybe we put them in a spot that has limited cell signal so the base station is not communicating or it puts limited signal out for the callers themselves. So those are the downsides of mobile base stations. There are certain signs when it actually works really well, particularly for training. 
we have a lot of conservation district or forest service projects with six or seven producers and they're all at their home ground and then they go up onto the forest where the network is that the base stations or the base stations were provided by the forest service and then they need to train those animals and that training period is you know four to five days the home ranch hundred acres and they only need a base station there for those four or five days and in those situations sometimes we reserve a base station on a trailer we use it for producers A's week of training, the producer B's week of training, and then at the end of the training period, we can actually use that as supplemental coverage. So we can bring that base station up and maybe fill in a little hole or something like that. It's not our primary point of coverage, so if it does go down, it's not as big of an issue. We can still communicate with the callers. So that's a situation where those mobile units work well, but that's something we get a question on a lot, and we may actually end up designing around and engineering around in the future, but just not quite yet. Long answer, sorry. And does weather in some of those high elevations, you know, with the solar panels and everything else, is that, do you have some trouble with that? So these base stations are actually pretty rugged. They were designed for the Australian Outback to be helicoptered in and basically like forgotten about. So we have them up on some pretty big peaks in Colorado. I'm in, I'm in Denver, so I'll just speak to that. And they've gone through 100 mile per hour windstorms. I believe one has actually gotten struck by lightning before in South Dakota, and we simply had to flip the breakers. So they're pretty rough and rugged. Um, they're able to handle weather well. What, I, what we do say is you definitely want to put it on a spot that's going to catch some wind. They have the legs down, but there's space under the legs so the wind and the snow can actually blow through. What we want to avoid is the snow building up to a point where it actually covers the solar panel in a drift for a period of weeks. The batteries will power the system for five days, and it's actually designed to go down and then actually kick back on, even if we lose power completely. But if you have no power to the solar panel for weeks or months on end in like a deep winter, then those batteries can basically, it's like not having them on a trickle charge, so it hurt the, the lifespan of the battery. That's one thing we want to watch out for. But for the most part, they, they've held up really well, which has been good. And we've had 200 or so of them out there, and a lot of them on public ground in pretty rugged areas. What about uh, neighbors sharing them? Can Great you use more than one computer, one set of cattle? Yep. So we have, a, we call it the field of dreams approach. If you build it, they will come with the federal agencies. So what the BLM did in Colorado is they purchased a bunch of base stations through a conservation innovation grant and lit up the Colorado River Valley. And they allowed producers to purchase their own callers and then plug into that network. The way that a base station is designed is a lot like your cell phone. You and I may be pinging off the same cell tower right now, but only I can ever see my text and only you can ever see yours. Same thing with a base station, only you will ever see your callers. And then if we drive down the road, you know, I'm on my phone, it switches to the next cell tower, I don't even know the difference. Same thing with base station. It's just network infrastructure that the callers will plug into and neighbors can absolutely share it. Yes? So, what it can that expand to two people actually sharing the data because you got two or three people that take care of the cows and they want to each be able to see what the cows are doing at yeah. once at the same time? So you can have multiple logins to the herd manager software okay. or you can share the same password if you want to, it doesn't matter to us, but you okay. can certainly do so. Yep. We would say that it's probably good to have one person in charge of building the virtual fence lines mm -hmm. right now just because the software is built right now to build the product. The next version's coming, that's gonna be a lot more user friendly, but we'll be honest, it's a little confusing right now. So if you have multiple people in there putting virtual fence lines together, you know, it can get kind of messy. So if, even if there are multiple people with user logins, we just say nominate one person to build the virtual fence lines, even though everyone else can have access to the data to see what's going on. 